matchless in grace and mercy. There's nowhere we can... This is a wonderful opportunity to be here uh, in the house of the Lord and to share reflections uh, from the land of the Lord. Just come to your neighbor and give them a warm African handshake. And tell them, welcome to the house of the Lord. I was asked to share a reflection on commitment that leads to positive influence. Commitment that leads to positive influence. Who has had the greatest positive influence in your life up to now? And how? If we had time, we would have asked you to share with your neighbor. And some of your neighbors, being so spiritual, would have said Jesus. <laughs> Which is also true when we are looking at the human figures. I believe that each of us has had someone in our lives whose life works and example has affected us positively. Whether we are talking about parents, teachers, pastors, peers, mentors, etc. We are all and have been influenced in one way or another by people who have been significant in our lives. People who have influenced us positively. When we turn to the Bible, we see several characters of people whose life and legacy brought positive influence to the people around them, some of whom have been shared in this chapter of this semester. People like Paul, Timothy, Ruth, Esther, and so on and so forth. Today as we think about commitment that leads to positive influence, I would like us to pick some lessons from the life of Joseph. Joseph's story in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 37 to chapter 50. And most of us are familiar with this story, so I will not read every portion of it. We just take portions as we illustrate some of the points we are drawing from there. Now, there is no doubt that Joseph's life influenced many people positively. His life influenced his family, his life influenced the whole nation, Egypt, and the surrounding nations. As we recall, how people who are to be that, you know, ravaged by farming for seven years, found a solution when Joseph was used by God to bring a practical solution to a dire situation. Who would have thought that a boy who was sold as a slave rose to prominence in Egypt, became a ruler, a superpower at that time, and made such an impact that we continue to feel even today? That is the first one to look at today. Joseph, his life legacy, and how his life was supposed to influence. We first meet Joseph, Genesis chapter 30, verse 22 to 24, when he is born to Rachel, the second wife to Jacob. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 30, verse 22 to 24, Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. She became pregnant and gave birth to her son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Joseph and said, May the Lord add me another one. One so we all know how Joseph was born, uh, born in the house of Rachel and uh, together with his brother Benjamin. The next time we see Joseph in scripture is in Genesis 37, verse 1 to 4. He is a teenager now, 17 years. The Bible says from verse 1 to 4, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family life. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an honest love for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him, and he could not speak a kind word to him. So we see that Joseph was his father's favorite son. He was treated preferentially. He had this nice, princely court. And we also discovered that he was a Kibelebele kind of person. Now, for the non kenyans translation is in front, in front kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> because he used to report his brothers to his father. Everything they did in front, ten of them. And they hated him for that kind of behavior. Now, most of you, when you are, you are, you are, you are identified with Joseph, 
you remember how you used to spy on your brothers, especially the elder ones, and you would get rewards by your parents for saying what they did with the Christ of God. That was Joseph. Moving on, we see that Joseph was a dreamer. And he was not very wise in sharing his dreams. The Bible says in Genesis 37, verse 5 to 8, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were mighty sheep of bread out of the field, when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright. While your sheep gathered around me and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And so we see that Joseph from his youth was a very ambitious guy. He had this idea that God had you know, prepared him for great things and he was not too humble to keep quiet with it. In every opportunity he took this, he made his brothers know that he is a special one. And they hated him all the more, as the Bible says. From that point in Joseph's life, his life was turned into a roller coaster of intriguing twists and turns. As most preachers have summarized Joseph's life, can be summarized in four pieces, isn't it? Number one, the pit. Genesis 37, verse 21 to 34. We see his brother selling him and putting him to the pit, later on picking him from there uh, to sell him. Number two, Potiphar's house. Genesis 39, verse 1 to 4. He sold him to Potiphar's house in Egypt, where he worked as a slave, rising up to supervise him in that household. Number three, the prison, Genesis 39, 29 to 23. Because of false accusations of attempted rape by Potiphar's wife, he lands in prison and stayed there for a long time. And lastly, we see the palace, Genesis 41, verse 39 to 46. Eventually, because of interpreting the dream of the cup bearer, Pharaoh dreams and he is able to interpret the dream and becomes the prime minister, the second in command, uh, only to fail. Now, a question for you. Which of these seasons of Joseph's life do you identify with more, most? The feet, Potiphar's house, the prison, or the palace? Share with your neighbor. Potiphar's house was not there. Perhaps the palace would not have been there. All these were seasons in the life of Joseph. Allow me to draw a few lessons from the life of Joseph that are relevant to us today if we want to be people who make godly or positive influence in our society. Number one, we learn from Joseph and his experience that in life, what matters most is not what happens to us, but how we respond to what happens to us. I repeat, in life, what matters most is not what happens to us, but how we respond to what happens to us. In the story of Joseph, all of us are familiar with the hardships that Joseph went through. More than any of us may ever face. Number one, he had his favorite clothes taken away and put into a pit for no reason. One of the most amazing things in that passage is that the people, the brothers put Joseph in a pit as they were devouring the food that he had brought for them. Can you imagine how heartless these people were? They did not reject the food. The food they were devouring, but the man they did not like and were putting him into a pit. Second, he was sold as a slave by his own brothers to a foreign land due to their jealousy. Thirdly, in Potiphar's house, he faced sexual harassment and false accusation. Fourthly, he was thrown into prison on trumped up accusation and charges. Fifthly, he was forgotten in prison by the very man he had helped to get his job back. If it were you, how would you have it? These things would have made Joseph very bitter. With his brothers, with Potiphar and his wife, with the Capera, even with God. It is understandable as human beings, he was human too. However, we see that Joseph refused to let these hardships keep him down, but he used them as a stepping stone to greater things. He had a positive attitude towards life, and he did not keep asking, why me? And indulging in pity part. He would have more than say, where is God allowing, where is God in this situation? Why is he allowing all these bad things to happen to him? Why is he not intervening? Why is he keeping silent? But Joseph chose 
he looked at his challenges through the eyes of God. He saw what God was accomplishing through his life. He realized that God was behind all that he went through. And so we see in Genesis 45, verse 4 to 7, this is what Joseph the Bible says. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because, that one is important, it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. Verse 7. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse 8. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. That Joseph could look at his life and say, the brothers were instruments, and they all behaved very funny instruments but instruments in the hands of God. That is Joseph's perspective. Looking back, he does not blame his brothers. He sees that they were vessels in the hand of God to do something great. This is what is captured also in verse 50, in chapter 50, verse 19 to 20. The Bible says, his brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they say. But Joseph said to them, no, be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me but God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. It has been observed that pain and difficulty can either leave us better or better. The difference is how we choose to respond. What is our attitude when we face hardships, challenges, disappointments, betrayals, and difficulties? Like Joseph, we all face challenges in life. But we need to determine, like Joseph, that we can trust God to see us through, and we can keep an attitude, not of complaining, mama and family, but we can keep an attitude of gratitude. Somebody has said, our attitude determines our altitude. It has also been said that there's a very small difference between people, but that small difference makes a big difference, and that difference is attitude. The things we go through are used by God to shape us and to mold us to the persons God wants us to be and to prepare us for the assignments God wants us to be. What is your attitude as you go through the various challenges that you go through life? You see, as I start here, I can focus on the challenges and the limitations that I find around me. Maybe as I dream, I would have loved my salary to be tripled. Maybe I'm a four bedroom big house here in this place. Maybe I should get a university car. Hallelujah. <laughs> to the and the service and fuel by the university. All these are valid dreams. As Pastor Peter says, all our dreams are valid. But if I focus on what I don't have, I will be squandering this opportunity on what I have. I can focus on what I don't have or see what is going, what God is doing in me and through me, and the opportunities that He gives me from day to day to make a difference in this place. As a student, you can choose to focus on the challenges and the limitations of being on air. You can begin to you know, just have an attitude, there is no swimming with the air, what we have is that place that floods, there is no seated for swimming. We have a small bus, a two seater, the campus is a 56 seater. What kind of university is this? You can focus, choose to focus on what is not, what you feel is not the best. But you can also choose to focus on what God can enable you to achieve even in this situation. The choice is always ours. Somebody has said, between what is done to you and how you respond, how you respond is a small wheel defined by the one choice. Our attitude as we go through life is important. The story is told of a chicken boy who smeared a bit of rotten egg on his grandfather's mustache when he was sleeping. Here. Yeah. When the grandfather woke up, he said, This room is smelly. He left that room and went to another room. This room is also smelly. He went to another room. This room is smelly. He said, The whole house is smelly. He decided to go outside. 
Let me have the smell for you. He said, the old one is smell. <laughs> the truth of the matter, the old one was not smell. It was what this what was put here. That is the power of an attitude. If you have a negative attitude, everything in life will look negative. Do you have an attitude of gratitude or an attitude of gambling? We learn from Joseph that story. Number two, we learn from Joseph that faithfulness, character, and integrity are central to a life of influence. Joseph was diligent in his work. As a slave in Potter's house, in the prison, he worked so diligently that before long, he was promoted to be the supervisor. Genesis 39, verse 24, the Bible says, The Lord of Joseph, so that he was far and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found him in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted his care everything he owned. Joseph was faithful and diligent in his work. We too can learn a lesson from that. We do not need to wait until we are in the best of circumstances to do our best. We make the most of the present circumstances that we have. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 16, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are in. But Joseph was also a man of character and integrity. He refused to sleep with Potiphar's wife when it was so convenient and the temptation was so strong. I have always reflected on Joseph's temptation <coughs> and it's not easy one. Number one, it must have been very flattering to Joseph's ego that as a slave, his master's wife found him attractive. Isn't it? But more importantly, this temptation was not a one-time flirting or teasing. The lady was serious. <laughs> yeah, she made business. She was persistent. This is what the Bible actually says. Genesis 39, verse 10. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, I like that emphasis, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. If it was some of the brothers I know, <laughs> <laughs> they would have seen this as a golden opportunity. <laughs> After all, she has offered herself. In Kiswahili, we say, I'm in the letter of my name. Translation, she has brought herself. Or, as other young people would say, I'm a two now in the police station. Translation, throwing stones at the police station. What did she expect? If you throw stones at the police station, what will come back is no stone. Goodness. But Joseph did not he take advantage of that opportunity. He did not want to compromise his integrity. He loved his God. He said to Mrs. Potter, how can I do such a wicked thing before my God? The fear of God kept him and refused to sleep in this land. I want to say to us, God always takes note of the things we do, which brings glory to his name. Even when those things we do are costly to us. We live in a society that believes in shortcuts and get rid quick schemes. But we, like Joseph, are to be people of character and integrity. I think that the context of this, especially in terms of sexual morality, is something that we have to think about even more. Especially the young people. We live in a society which is obsessed with sex. Sex is being used to sell everything. Even things that have no association with sex at all. People, some people want to sell a car, a sexy lady. Toothpaste, sexy lady. Cement, sexy Now you want to sell. Where does, where does all these things have to do with sexuality and sex? We live in a crazy society. Sex is everywhere. In the media, in the internet, phones, adverts. It is in this context that God calls us to be sexually realized. You see, some young men are not falling in sin just because they have not had a clear opportunity. But Joseph had opportunities that he purposed in his heart 
not to do that which he did. And the Bible says he had to flee physically. You know, there are some temptations that you are not required to resist. The Bible says flee. And if the Bible says flee, don't edit it and say resist. If the Bible says you will not succeed, one has to feel. In some circumstances, you are less as a spiritual gift from God. Run <laughs> for your dear life. Amen? That's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. Flee from sexual immorality. Don't resist. Some people keep resisting. I mind this. The more you mind, the more your trouser is going down. I mind that it is. You have to leave. What does it say? Here is one person in life that I need to. It is always easier to avoid temptations than to resist temptations. What does it do? That be the last lesson. God's plan for us reaches beyond us and includes the blessing of others. God's plan for us reaches beyond us and includes the blessing of others. Genesis 45, verse 4 to 8. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they are down, he said, I am your brother. Joseph, the one who sold you to you. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourself for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. We see that Joseph understood that God's plan for his life was bigger than his dreams. God's plan for Joseph's life was the saving of many lives. The whole thing was not about Joseph. It was just a vessel in God's hand. And this is true for us as well. This is true always in God's design. He blesses us in order to be a blessing. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Your life is not just about you. You are blessed to be a blessing. One has to feel. We must never look at our lives in isolation because our lives are closely intertwined or linked with the life of others. God's plan is to do more with our lives than we are ready to settle for. He does not just want to bless us individually, but He wants to bless our families, our communities, and our nation through our lives. Joseph's life impacted many people in his day, and his life still speaks to us today. The truth of the matter is, our decisions and actions always affect more people than we think. Always affects more people, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, whether we intend it or not. Therefore, every time we make a decision or take an action, we need to know that the consequences of our actions and decisions will flow to other people, whether it is good or bad. Good example in the Bible is David. When David chose to sleep with the Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, he thought it was just a simple thing. You know, what is wrong with a man in this need in, in enjoying some extra curricular activities uh, in the evening? You know what I mean. They hear and understand. For him, it was just what we call a short fling, something just to pass the evening time he was born. However, as you continue to read the story, the string of consequences was so much that if David knew what would follow after that few minutes of pleasure, he would have just run away like Joseph. Because what happened? It led to the life of Uriah, it led, I mean, the death of Uriah, the death of the child, rebellion in his house, eventually after of his son, slept with his concubines in broad daylight on the roof. This is the big picture we must never lose. We are not meant to operate in the spirit of me, myself, and I. We are to be channels of God's blessing to others, positively influencing them for the sake of Christ. God wants us to fill us, God wants to fill us with blessings so that they can overflow to others. And we will continue to receive from God as long as we are ready to pass the blessings on. But when we stop to pass them on, you become saturated and you cannot receive anymore. Tell your neighbor, look at them and tell them, your life is not just about you. You 
you are the blessed to be a blessing. Amen. In conclusion, I desire myself and pray that my life will bring positive influence and impact on the people around me here and everywhere God takes me. I hope that is your desire and prayer too. But there is a secret to it. And we see that in the life of Joseph. It is found in Genesis 39, verse 2, and verse 23. The Bible says, Then God was with Joseph, and he prospered. Verse 23. They weren't paying no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph, and gave him success in whatever he did. The secret, the presence of the Lord. The hero of this story is not Joseph, but God who orchestrated everything behind the scene, using an unlikely person in unlikely places, places and situations to fulfill his purposes. And that is still true today. If we are many people who are making godly influence, then we must design God's presence in our lives. That's why Moses told God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us out of here. For ultimately what matters, <laughs> is our relationship with God and God's presence with us. As somebody has said, me and God, we are the majority and we are on the winning side. Have you invited Jesus into your life? Can you say like Joseph that God is with me? That is a question. Are you aware of his presence in your life as you do day-to-day -day activities? The Lord was with Joseph and because of that, he remains a pillar a testimony, someone whose life spoke to the people in this generation and continues to speak to us. You were matchless in grace and mercy. There's nowhere we can hide from your love.